I'd like to acknowledge before we get started that we're all here on uh, Treaty 6 territory and the homeland, the traditional homeland of the Métis. Um, my family came here. I'm the third generation immigrant. And uh, with that comes a lot of responsibilities being born into a society uh, with certain privileges and having been lucky through most of my life due to those, in addition to those privileges. So whenever I do a land acknowledgement, I try to think about all of the things that come with that, the responsibilities, the um, keeping in mind where I am, who I am and what I can do with that. So thank you all for coming. I'll turn it over to Katya now to, um, or no, Julia. We're gonna go to Julia and uh, she'll tell us a little bit more about tonight's presentation. Thanks, Megan. And I hope everyone can hear me okay. My internet seemed a little sketchy uh, a, a while back, but my name is Julia and I am the organizer of Cafe Scientifique Saskatoon or Cafe Sci YXE. And I often collaborate with other groups around the city on Cafe Sci Talks. So I have to say a big thank you to the organizers of this event, to uh, SES and SPL for having me, um, for having Cafe Sci as a, a co-organizer and co-sponsor and a guest. And we're really delighted to have Katie Harris here. And so kind of the backstory to why this, this partnership arose is that, Katie, you might remember you were scheduled to talk in person at Winston's, the, the background behind me, in April 21st, 2020. So two days almost, uh, two years almost to the day. And uh, we all know what happened with that. We all know Katie created a pandemic so that she could just gather more data for two <laughs> years and then give this kick-ass talk that she's gonna give this evening with even more interesting information. Uh, your talk back in 2020 was called Wild in the City. It was a partnership with Nature City Festival and Candace Savage. So we carry that spirit with us here. And, and again, I'm, I'm just delighted that this has made its way to, uh, you know, in a circular roundabout <laughs> way, we we're doing this event anyway, despite the odds. And so I'm going to put some information into the chat after uh, I hand over the mic to Katya, and we'll tell you about SES and introduce Katie. So if you're interested in future Cafe Sci events, which, you know, this is the last one for this season, but we're gonna resume in the fall. We'll see if we'll be in Winston's and uh, you can just put yourself on the mailing list or check our social media. So if you're interested again, please check the chat for those details. And I believe that's that's all I have to say. Massive thank yous and very excited to be here. Looking forward to Katie's talk. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks, uh, Julia. Yeah, good to see, uh, good to have uh, you guys here today too, uh, joining us um, in uh, this sustainability speaker series. Good evening, everyone. My name is Katya Gutkova. Uh, I'm a co-organizer of uh, sustainability speaker series. Um, and before I introduce uh, our speaker, I want to say a few words about Saskatchewan Environmental Society. So the Saskatchewan Environmental Society or SES, um, has been operating since 1970s on important issues uh, such as climate change, sustainable energy, water protection, biodiversity preservation, and reduction of pollutants in our environment. If you aren't already a member, I encourage you to join us uh, to find out uh, more about uh, our diverse projects, activities, and how to get involved, how to volunteer. Um, uh, you can find out more on our website at www.environmentalsociety.ca. And if you would like to receive uh, email notifications uh, about our sustainability speaker series, um, please, uh, email us at info at environmentalsociety.ca and uh, indicate uh, that you would like to be notified about these events. 
let me now introduce our uh, outstanding speaker tonight, Katie Harris. Katie comes uh, from a small community in northern Manitoba called The Pass. Growing up uh, surrounded by nature, she grew to love the wild and all it provided. Pursuing this passion led her to Lakeland College in 2014, where she completed an environmental science diploma with a dual major in both conservation and restoration ecology and wildlife and fisheries conservation. Feeling called to higher education, Katie then transferred to the University of Saskatchewan, where she completed Bachelor of Agriculture degree in just two years, majoring in environmental science. Following this and uh, upon deciding to, uh, to pursue graduate school in 2019, Katie was granted the opportunity to spearhead the development of Saskatoon's very first citywide urban wildlife monitoring research study uh, as part of her master's thesis project. Uh, recently, Katie has transferred from master's to PhD program and will be continuing to develop and guide the growth of this project for the next few years. So please join me in welcoming Katie. And with this, I'll pass it over to uh, Katie's presentation on uh, wildlife in Saskatoon tonight. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will share my screen now. Um, Katya, I can see you. Can you just nod if you can see my screen? Yes. It's yes. shared? Okay. Excellent. Thank you. I will minimize that and let's get started. So thank you very much for the introduction. Um, hello, good evening, everyone. Thank you very much for joining me on this uh, very snowy, blustery evening here in Saskatoon. Uh, my name is Katie Harris, and I am a researcher and a PhD candidate at the University of Saskatchewan. So my research uses trail cameras to monitor urban wildlife and the effects of urbanization on wildlife biodiversity and adaptations within an urban ecosystem or a city. Um, I would like to mention uh, right here at the start that all of the wildlife photos that you see throughout this entire presentation um, with the single exception of my fourth slide are all my images uh, primarily from my research and depict wildlife that are living here in Saskatoon. So I'm gonna start off by setting the stage for my research and giving this like big picture type overview of what urbanization is and what biodiversity is and why any of this matters and what it even is that really allows an animal to be successful at life in the city. Uh, I will then get into some of the specifics of my research and then I'll go through some of the interesting things that I've found and seen so far throughout the course of my work. So what is the issue? Well, urbanization, uh, which is essentially the growth of cities, involves transforming our natural environments to fulfill human needs. So basically, there is this very large, very rapid and near permanent change that is happening to our native environments. And it's caused by the horizontal growth or sprawl as new roads or subdivisions or housing or those types of things are developed as a city grows. So this horizontal growth or urban sprawl, it happens every single year, and it's resulting in many different changes and impacts to our natural ecosystems and landscapes. And then as a consequence of this to the species who live on those landscapes. To add to this, uh, each year an increasing number of people are moving from rural areas and into urban areas. And alongside this, the global human population continues to increase each year as well. So more and more people are moving into cities, which is driving urban growth. And then more and more people are also being born in cities, which is also driving that growth. So these factors are a huge reason or cause for the changes that are happening on our landscapes and the changes that are happening to the species who rely on those habitats. 
And so this is essentially the basis for my research on urban wildlife ecology and the ways that wildlife are or are not adapting to urban areas and life in the city. So let's talk about biodiversity. So biodiversity is defined as the amount or the variety of species living in an area, and it is super important for many reasons. For starters, a biodiverse ecosystem is one that is functioning in a proper, healthy way. So we humans, we rely on these ecosystems in almost every facet of our lives because almost everything that we utilize on a daily basis came at one point, you know, from the environment. So once we start changing things about the landscape, what happens is that biodiversity will decline and lacking, you know, any intervention, the resources that these areas used to provide become much less available or completely unavailable, um, depending on the system. This relates to much more than just actual goods like timber or fibers, for instance. Um, healthy ecosystems are also responsible for these essential processes like climate regulation, like soil production and soil health, clean air, clean water, like the list kind of goes on and on. So protecting and conserving biodiversity is really key for maintaining these healthy and sustainable environments. Another important reason for biodiversity conservation relates to human well-being. So there have been many, many, many scientific studies on how humans react to differing levels of biodiversity. And across the board, all facets of human well-being, so mental, physical, and emotional health, are all enhanced when interacting with areas of high biodiversity. So let's just think about it for a second and let's imagine yourself here in this park, maybe just like on a nicer day than when I had taken this picture. Um, and in this park, as you can see, there is a variety of different shrubs and trees and they provide shelter and shade and a whole variety of different types of food sources. And so because of that, we will also see all sorts of different birds here. So flying, nesting, foraging, and they haven't quite popped up yet, but once the weather warms up some more, there is also a variety of native wildflowers that grow here. And so there will also be all sorts of different insects buzzing around and pollinating, and also providing another type of food source for insectivores. And then the tall grass here is also serving a really important role by sheltering all sorts of smaller mammals like mice and ground squirrels. And there's the small wetland nearby, so there will also be different waterfowl and amphibians. And you may not see them when you're standing here, but because this diversity of life is existing here, there is also a variety of larger wildlife species here as well. So I've seen foxes, coyotes, deer, uh, weasels, raccoons, rabbits, and much more at this site, but you get the picture. This is what I mean by a biodiverse area. It's an area containing a multitude of different life forms all coexisting on a landscape. And the benefits of areas like this for human health have been scientifically proven. Just being here in this park, it just intrinsically, it makes us feel good. You know, it's relaxing and de-stressing and just kind of peaceful. And we do absolutely have access to these areas right here in the city of Saskatoon. So this is actually one of our city parks. Now let's go somewhere else. <laughs> let's hang out in this park. This is also a city park. Um, at first glance, you can tell that there are some pretty obvious differences between this park and the one prior. So, you know, there are a few trees off in the distance, <laughs> but there's no shrubs. There's no tall grasses to shelter the smaller species. There's not really any flowers here other than probably like some dandelions. Uh, maybe there's a few birds, but most likely they're the common, you know, urban species like magpies or ravens or birds like that, but definitely not that huge variety of songbirds and others that we would see at that other location. Pretty much all you see as you look around this area, other than, you know, maybe a few trees and weedy plants is mowed lawn, right? There's just, there's just not much here. And so when looking at an area like this, solely through the lens of biodiversity. This lack of environmental diversity means that not many species are able to utilize or benefit from this area at all. Um, vegetation truly is the foundation of biodiversity. 
the more variety of plants there are, the more variety of other life there will be as well. And so really the only species that I see at sites like this um, beyond the, the few birds that I mentioned are really just jackrabbits. <laughs> so protecting or conserving biodiversity is really critical for wildlife, yes, and for enhancing diversity of all life forms, um, but also for much more than that as well. So it's also necessary for the maintenance of healthy ecosystems uh, and healthy human lives as well. Okay. So very unfortunately, biodiversity loss is one of the major consequences of urbanization. Um, and this loss is currently occurring at a rate more rapid than any since the last historical extinction event that happened uh, millions and millions of years ago. And we are currently in a global biodiversity crisis as every year more and more species become extinct. So this really is a matter of huge importance. And when you add in the fact that our modifying of the landscape for human needs has been identified as one of the major drivers for present day biodiversity loss, and the like actual primary number one cause of animal extinction in North America. This really emphasizes the need for urban research and stronger conservation in general, but urban conservation in specific. So why is it exactly that some animals can do so well in cities while others are just completely unable to survive here? Uh, it all really has to do with wildlife adaptations to urban areas. So these are the why and the how certain species are able to quite happily um, live alongside us. There are several features that allow an animal to be successful in urban habitats. Um, I'm gonna go through each of them in more detail, but they all relate to adaptability and in general are um, the ability to be flexible with primary activity patterns, this tends to show up as nocturnal behavior um, for most species, but not for all of them. Also the ability to live within small home ranges or small habitat patches, um, the ability to make use of subsidized food sources, which is just a nice way of saying human, you know, free human-based food sources. And then lastly, and possibly most important is the ability to tolerate humans and associated human disturbances like sudden noises, light pollution, heavy vehicle traffic, um, that kind of stuff. So first let's talk about um, this ability to have flexible activity patterns. So many, many animals live in cities, yet we really rarely see them in our day-to-day -day lives. This is because most urban wildlife have, out of necessity, shifted to behaving primarily nocturnally. This is a coexistence adaptation for living in densely populated urban areas. Um, animals feel safest when their perceived threat level is lowest. Makes sense, right? And the threat level in urban areas tends to be lowest in the nighttime uh, when human activity is at its lowest point. And actually like the vast majority of all of my inner city photos uh, for most species occur once the sun has set. This of course uh, is not true for all animals. So smaller prey species like ground squirrels, for instance, uh, behave quite oppositely. So they are most active during the day. And one of the reasons for this is because humans, um, while perceived as a threat to many animals and especially predators, can actually be used as a shield by other animals, um, typically as a mechanism to reduce predation because predators tend to actively avoid areas that are densely populated with humans or avoid the times of day that have high human activity associated with them. Um, so this is a really neat adaptation. It's called human shielding. Uh, and it is something that I will be investigating more uh, in my research. So second is this ability to live within small home ranges. So let's take this quick overhead look at Saskatoon. This uh, map here is the Miwasan Valley's Saskatoon connectivity map. It illustrates the potential available habitats that we have here in the city, uh, which are all those colors listed on the side there. And then the non-suitable urban habitats, which is all of that gray and is pretty much all of the built features like build, uh, buildings and parking lots and roads. And then that lighter green color marks the potential connectivity 
or potential wildlife travel corridors, uh, which are areas of land that may allow an animal to move between isolated habitat patches. And these are absolutely critical for allowing wildlife to access required resources on a fragmented landscape like a city, and especially for some of our larger mammals uh, like moose. So you'll notice here that other than the egg lands um, at the city periphery, any available habitat within the city is pretty small and fragmented and generally just kind of isolated from all the other habitat patches. This is in great contrast to natural type ecosystems, which unless we're disturbing the landscape should be composed of much larger and connected habitats. So these small patches means that an animal has access to much less uh, spatial resources than they typically would use outside a city. And this is one of the many reasons why we do not see many larger animals in cities. Uh, this is also why connectivity is so hugely important in urban areas. So that refers to an animal's ability to move between these tiny habitat patches. And actually, most of my low, low diversity sites are in these areas in the map that are not connected in any real way to any other patches like this area um, up here and this area over here, for instance. I also have to mention, of course, that uh, we are pretty lucky here in Saskatoon to have the river that cuts right through the central portion of the city. And then associated with that is this really great uh, movement corridor you can see along the river. And so that most mostly connects the north side of the city uh, with the south side, and it provides a really important way for animals to traverse the city. Uh, these are just a couple examples of some corridors that we have here in Saskatoon. So they can include anything from roadside ditches, like this photo here on the bottom right, to just like walking paths, to trails, to like footpaths that are made by people just walking through the snow. Um, so corridors can come in really a huge variety of shapes and sizes. Some of them are definitely higher quality than others but they're all pretty equally necessary for urban diversity and diversity conservation. So third is the ability to make use of subsidized food sources. Um, so because certain species are unable to exist in cities and typically large predators, um, the urban food chain actually varies quite a bit from what we would see in wild type ecosystems. So what would have been the top or apex predators, so wolves, cougars, et cetera, are just not tolerated by humans. And so even if they do show up here, um, which does, it does happen occasionally, they are like immediately removed. And so the animals that we do tolerate in cities tend to be these lower food chain species. And these types of animals tend to be opportunistic in their feeding habits. So what that means is they will pretty much eat whatever is available whenever they have the opportunity to eat it. Also, um, the predators that we have here are omnivorous as well as opportunistic. So while they do predate smaller prey species, they will also consume pretty much whatever else is around them. So these human created food sources include things like compost, gardens, um, edible shrubs, trees, and of course, human waste like landfills, garbage bins, recycling, et cetera. Um, much of this, of course, really should not be consumed by animals, uh, specifically things like garbage. And I really want to emphasize that we should not ever be actively feeding wild animals and especially human foods like bread or really anything that has been refined. This type of food can be really bad for wildlife who like not only evolved with but are just internally built to consume natural foods. Uh, also, just as an aside here, um, any garbage bins, recycling bins, backyard compost bins, things like that should always be securely closed to remove any potential access to them by animals. And something else that um, a lot of people don't consider is outdoor pet food. So leaving pet food outside can attract wildlife like coyotes to your yard. So unless you want coyotes in your yard, which most people I talk to do not, uh, I do always advise keeping pet food and pet bowls and things like that inside as well. And then the last one I wanna talk about is this ability to tolerate humans. So this human tolerance uh, is a trait that our urban jackrabbits really exemplify. And so I'm using them here as my main example. Um, I don't know about anyone else here, but there have been more than a few occasions where I am able to like walk 
not even sneakily, but just normally walk up to a jackrabbit in the city and get up to like a, a few feet away from them before they even, you know, bother to, to start moving away from me. This is not something that happens in natural ecosystems where natural selection tends to remove the slow movers from the population. And uh, there has never been a single instance I can think of where I've been able to get within meters of wild rabbits, never mind feet, before they get frightened and fly away. Um, so one of the terms for this fear-based trait is vigilance. And having a lower vigilance level in urban areas can allow animals to reduce stress and save energy by reducing the energetic losses that result from fright and subsequent flight. Of course, a lower vigilance level is only useful when the thing triggering that flight response is not actually looking to eat the animal. So this mostly really occurs in cities where there is this like never ending external stimuli from constant noises and lights and dynamic movements. And this is something that most of us humans mostly get used to, but it can be very stressful um, and exhausting for wildlife. So some urban species have adapted in such a way that has dulled that sense, so to speak. And this allows them to have a much higher tolerance for humans and human activity, uh, which also allows them to be much more active during the day. Of course, this would be a massive detriment to survival in wild systems. There is a very good reason why certain species evolved to have heightened vigilance, but it is something um, really fascinating that we are seeing in some of our urban species. And they are essentially passing these urban traits onto their offspring as well. So it'll be really interesting to see how this actually plays out um, into the future. All right, so that brings me to the end of the background portion of things. And now I'm gonna talk a bit about my research. So this project began back in September, 2019, um, when I had been exploring different research ideas for my MSc or my master's thesis. And my supervisor, Dr. Ryan Brook, um, had approached me after having just met with a group of really keen individuals who were wanting to initiate a large scale wildlife monitoring study here in the city. So these individuals like eventually formed my stakeholder committee. And so this includes several really awesome people uh, affiliated with the University of Saskatchewan, the Mwasin Valley Authority, uh, Wild About Saskatoon, the Saskatoon Forestry Farm, the City of Saskatoon and the City Parks Department, Wanuskewin Heritage Park, and the Saskatoon Nature Society. So Ryan offered me this opportunity to lead the development and spearhead the first year. Initially, it has been much longer than a year, but the first year initially of wildlife monitoring as my thesis study. So I, of course, said yes. And ever since this project has just continued to grow and really opened my eyes to the abundance of species that we have living alongside us that most people are actually like pretty unaware of, myself included, um, up until I, I really started this work. So this really is a highly community engaged and a novel study within the city of Saskatoon. And so we aim to create a baseline understanding of the distribution and ecology of urban wildlife as a long-term research program that monitors change while also testing ecological theories in the context of the urban ecosystem. This research study has also been accepted by the Urban Wildlife Information Network or UN, um, which is an organization that provides guidance for initiating these types of studies, a structure for study design, and then a universal database for use by member cities. Saskatoon has been an official member of this network since 2019, and we were the second Canadian city to join um, behind Edmonton. So there are 30, uh, currently 35 cities in all associated with this network, and we all share standardized methods and protocols which um, among other benefits really allows for relatively easy data sharing between cities. And so this is really great for expanding the scope of urban research. So the overall purpose of my study is to understand the patterns in urban wildlife occurrence using a network of trail cameras that I've placed around um, the city of Saskatoon. So most of my cameras and initial supplies for this project were very generously donated by the Saskatoon Forestry Farm, um, which really gave this project the momentum it needed to get started. This really is like the very first study of its kind here. And so I am building the urban wildlife data bank for the city 
and creating the baseline of local wildlife occurrences that can be used to look at things like trends or patterns over long periods of time, um, which is a, a, a framework that we're really you know, lacking here in the city. Um, to be a little bit more specific, my research will be determining exactly which species we have here and how they're using the city, um, connecting these occurrences to the different levels of urban development that we have in different parts of the city, identifying some of the ways that wildlife are changing in order to adapt to our local um, urban habitats, and then making some connections between how Saskatoon as a city was and is still being shaped and developed by the people who live here, and how that in turn is actually shaping our wildlife communities. So this is just like a general overview of my study design, just to provide a bit of an idea of how my cameras are laid out across the city. So I have 30 cameras in total, um, five of which were placed within each of the six urban habitats that we identified here. So again, listed on the side. Um, I am examining wildlife occurrences across something called an urban to rural gradient. And so each of my camera sites um, has also been classified into an urbanization category. And this is based on the percentage of built features within one kilometer of each camera. So just referring to the non-natural things like roads and buildings. So there are three urbanization categories. They are urban, which is the highly developed areas, peri-urban or suburban, which are the moderately developed areas, and then rural, which are the low development areas. So this built analysis down here in the corner um, shows the proportion of my camera sites located within each of those categories. So it came out to 12 cameras in urban zones and then nine cameras each within the peri-urban and rural zones. Uh, so you can see here on this map, I made a bit clearer what I mean by the urban to rural gradient. So it refers to how the urban sites tend to be concentrated within the center portion of the city um, and then transition out to the areas with higher amounts of natural features, which are the peri-urban and then rural areas at the city periphery. And then again, we of course have this, the river that cuts through the city and that provides areas with more moderate amounts of natural features, uh, which resulted in these few um, peri-urban sites uh, that we likely wouldn't have here otherwise. <clears throat> so I was supposed to start uh, field work back in March 2020. <laughs> this, of course, was also when the COVID-19 pandemic reached Canada. So I ended up being delayed by about seven months before I was able to actually begin data collection. Thankfully, I was able to get my cameras out and begin monitoring back in September of 2020. So I've been doing year round field work ever since. Um, so it's been about one and a half years of monitoring so far. Uh, these are what my camera sites look like. So I do try to, I do try to keep them discreet. Um, that can be somewhat impossible in certain locations. There's maybe like one suitable tree in the area, um, like this spot up here. So if I can, I do try to keep the cameras more, you know, tucked away than out in the open. But of course, that's only possible if there's cover around. Um, so I do what I can. <laughs> I have each trail camera set inside a metal security box and then secured with a cable lock and a tree strap to the mount, which is typically a tree. Each camera also has a tag on it that identifies it as being a part of an academic research study at the University of Saskatchewan and also includes our contact info. Really surprisingly, um, we've only gotten less than a handful uh, in total of concerned citizens calling to ask about them and verify the reasons for the camera. In the early days of this study, we had really been prepared for and, and definitely expecting much more than just a few calls about them. But really, the overall response to the cameras has been largely positive. Not completely positive. <laughs> I have had um, multiple thefts and camera breaking vandalism events occur. And so um, because of that, I have also added padlocks to all of the cameras. And in some of my higher risk locations, I've chained them as well. Um, I'll also mention here that I totally discard all of the photos I collect that have people in them. I keep only the wildlife photos and of those I am analyzing only the mammal species. And just a fun fact, so from the period of September 2020, which is when monitoring began, to December 2021, I've had approximately 10,000 wildlife occurrences in total um, at my cameras. So 
By occurrences, I mean the number of times that I've had an individual animal physically occur or appear in front of one of my cameras. So not population sizes, but it's still a pretty big number. <laughs> and especially when you consider how small of an area my cameras are actually capturing relative to the total area of the city. So that's pretty cool. Okay, so um, I'm gonna touch on some of my preliminary results, starting off with a discussion about actual diversity here in Saskatoon, and then ending off with an overview of the species that I've found here so far. Um, so this particular map is a little bit dated now, but it depicts most wildlife species that I've identified so far in my study um, and is labeled according to something called a diversity index. So biodiversity is a measure of a few different factors. So it takes into account the total number of species in an area, as well as the proportionality of species occurrences. So essentially the main point here is that the higher the diversity index, which is that number in the center of those pie charts, um, the more biodiverse that particular site is. And so you can see that here in this map, the sites that are dominated by one species or one color have a lower diversity index than the sites that are split into multiple species. And just by looking at this map, um, we can see that the biodiversity index is overall highest at the city perimeter and then lower in the city interior. This, this is probably not a huge surprise to anyone, <laughs> but it is still really important to document this both scientifically and statistically. And since this is the first study of its kind here in the city, um, these initial analyses are hugely important for making those long-term predictions and examining trends over time. And then lastly, I just want to point out here that the most diverse site I have so far um, is the site here with a diversity index of 1.67. Um, this is, of course, obviously one of my sites right beside the river, and it really highlights the importance of that conserved riverbank area to most of the species that we have here in the city. Conversely, the least diverse site we have is over here um, with a diversity index of 0.13. This site is an urban site. Um, it's one of those small urban parks that are not connected in any way to any other natural area. Um, and it's surrounded on all four sides by heavily residential features. Um, so the only mammal species that I've seen here are jackrabbits and it pretty closely resembles that low biodiversity park that I highlighted um, way back at the start of this presentation. So, this map and these diversity trends are very likely to fluctuate in the future as I collect more information, um, but I do expect these patterns to remain relatively similar just due to the ability of the more rural or naturalized sites to fulfill the requirements of a wider range of species than most urban sites can. And okay, so now I would like to introduce everyone to the wildlife that we have here in Saskatoon. So pictured on this slide here are 10 of the 17 species I've found in Saskatoon so far. So I'm going to talk about each of them, but I'm going to start by going through in detail the four most common species here um, who have all occurred in much higher proportions than the other 13. So to start is the white-tailed jackrabbit. So this is one of two hair species we have here in Saskatoon. Um, they do appear to be the species that has best adapted to our urban habitats and urban life. And so to nobody's surprise, they are the species with the highest number of occurrences on my cameras so far. Before I start going through this, I just wanna mention that these numbers in these tables are the total number of individual occurrences captured by my cameras. So again, not actual population sizes, but a really good identifier of the distribution of these species throughout the city and a really helpful starting point for identifying key areas and hotspots and important habitats and really examining which species are making the most use of which parts of our city. So I've had 3,898 individual occurrences so far. I've seen them the most at site 12, um, which I've highlighted here in this map. So this is a peri-urban site, um, but it's really close to one of the city's really large community gardens. And so this definitely acts as a draw for these, uh, these animals. I also wanted to give an honorable mention to a few other sites with very high occurrences. 
So sites two, 15 and 20. And you'll note that these are all urban sites and actually are all very low diversity sites that are disconnected and isolated from other habitat patches. Next is the red fox. So this is one of our two wild canids in the city. Um, and one of the ways that they have managed to thrive in our city, which they really have, um, is by adapting to life in some of our highly urban areas and areas with lots of humans and human activity, uh, which are places that coyotes, who are their biggest urban competitor, um, tend to avoid. So I've had 2,350 individual fox occurrences so far, and I've seen them the most at site 13. Uh, it is an urban site, but it's really close to the river and also really close to the train tracks. So right near two really good travel corridors. Um, I also wanted to give an honorable mention to sites 18 and 19, also by the river, and then 29, which is one of our very naturalized parks. So foxes have distributed themselves fairly well throughout the city. And they are especially making fairly good use of all of these interior habitats, um, as well as our available corridors. So they are very adaptable animals and much more tolerant to human activity than many other mammals are, and especially um, our other predators that we have here. And then fourth is the mule deer. So this is one of the two deer species that we have, the other being white-tailed deer. Um, also, I might add, this species appears to have adapted to local urban settings way better than white-tailed deer. Um, I've only seen those at a few of my cameras and they have all been only at my most rural sites. So that's been something really interesting as well. So I've had 1,506 individual mule deer occurrences, and I've seen them the most at Site 7, um, which is an urban site located in a residential neighborhood, but with a nice little um, green space that is connected, which is the key word here, um, to the outer edge of the city. And it also contains a dense patch of tree and shrub cover that they utilize quite heavily as cover. Um, and then an honorable mention to sites 1, 3, and 22, all at that south, southwest edge of the city. Um, I haven't really captured very many at most of my central camera sites so far, but I definitely have actually seen them, like, you know, in the center of the city, like with my eyes while out and about. Um, I just haven't really caught them on camera in those interior spots yet, but, but they are definitely there. I also just want to mention that I have seen like many young deer here on my cameras as well. This is just a couple examples, but I have many more pictures, mostly of mule deer fawns, but a few white tails as well. And so there is this evidence that our urban populations are not only surviving in our urban habitats, but actually reproducing here as well, um, which is always a really good sign for a, a healthy population. And then lastly, we have the coyote. So coyotes, they do thrive in urban settings, um, but they do so through the avoidance of areas that are highly urban or have high human presence or human infrastructure. So while they are actually considered as the apex or top predator in urban habitats, um, they're generally found more so at spots that have fewer people around. So I've had 1,110 individual coyote occurrences and I've seen them the most at site three, um, which is a rural site at the Southwest corner of the city and not coincidentally in the same area as the high concentration of mule deer, um, which is one of their preferred prey species. The same goes for site five over there. Um, and then the other honorable mention goes to site 30 over here on the Southeast side of the city. Uh, which is one of our very highly naturalized parks sitting at the border of Saskatoon and connected, keyword again, to the surrounding landscape. And so they're able to um, enter and exit the city very easily there. Um, so they do occur throughout the city as well, um, but the few times that I've found them in the city interior, it's almost always been at either more naturalized areas or areas near to a travel corridor. And pretty much all of my coyote images within the city proper have occurred in the nighttime. So one of the ways that they have adapted to life in the city is by shifting to a primarily nocturnal activity pattern. And so that is that behavioral adaptation for the avoidance of humans um, that I spoke about earlier. All right, so we are down to my last few slides now.
So um, the other 13 species that I found here have all occurred in much less abundance than the four that I just went over, but they're definitely here and managing to live in our habitats. Um, that ability of wildlife species to adapt to urban settings, it, it tends to occur across a spectrum. So one end of the spectrum are species that just cannot live or adapt to urban settings. And so those are most of our larger species or large predators. And then the other end of the spectrum are species who are very much able to adapt to urban settings. And in some cases can actually reach like much higher population sizes in urban versus native habitats. So the white-tailed jackrabbit of course is a good example of that. However, most wildlife species, like the ones that I'm about to go over, all tend to actually just fall, you know, somewhere more in the middle of that spectrum um, and not at the extreme ends. So starting with the um, North American beaver. So I've seen a couple of these guys um, and they've shown up at a few of my sites only along the river, of course. We also have black bears. Um, so this is the only this is the only one that I've seen and it was outside the city proper it was in a rural area so don't panic but they are here um, and they are traversing our, our landscape around the city. Um, we also have weasels so this is a long tailed weasel um, also short tailed weasels. We have moose um, more than you might think actually more than I had thought when I started monitoring um, I've caught about 10 or 15 of them on camera now, um, a few of them like really deep inside the city, but of course the majority have been at the city edge. So this was something that was quite surprising to me when I first started this project. We also have muskrats. So um, I've seen them a couple times, um, not by the river, but in some of the ponds that we have um, in our city parks. We also have the North American porcupine. Um, so they show up quite frequently actually in a lot of my rural sites that are part cropland and part woodland. We have Richardson's ground squirrels. Um, so these guys are what you see in what feels like the thousands or millions sometimes um, in the summertime at the U of S campus and in other parts of the city as well, but definitely, definitely on campus.